Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Comedian MTG. My name is Ian. Today, I have a deck tech for a commander that I have been having a ton of fun with, the best frog in CEDH. There, I said it. Sorry, I'm starting this episode off with some hot takes, but we're talking about Grolnok, the new Simic frog from Crimson Vow, a super cool commander, one that I love. The strategy is so fun, and I'm so excited to bring this deck tech to you today. If you've been enjoying these deck techs, if you like this video, please go down and hit like and subscribe. It helps out the channel a ton. Liking the video lets YouTube know you enjoy content like this. Also, if you're feeling generous and you want to go that extra mile, please check out patreon.com slash comedian MTG. Any help is super, super appreciated. It helps keep the channel going. It helps me travel to events, gets you coverage on all sorts of stuff like that. So anything like that would be greatly appreciated. All right, without any further ado, let's jump into this deck. Our commander today Today is Grolnok the Omnivore, and to understand this deck, we're going to have to break down this commander piece by piece. So it's two in a blue for a 3-3 legendary creature, Frog. Grolnok says whenever a frog you control attacks itself, you mill three cards. Whenever a permanent card is put into your graveyard from your library, exile it with a croak counter on it. Now it's very important that you notice that all three of these sentences are broken into different sections, and we'll cover that in a second. And you can play lands and cast spells from among cards you own in exile with croak counters on them. So basically, when Grolnok attacks, you mill the top three. Any permanents get exile with croak counters and you can cast and play basically permanents from them because non-permanent things will not be exiled with croak counters. Now there's some cute interactions here that we'll cover when we go over later parts of the deck, but that's the basic idea behind it. It's important to note when you're looking at this card, a couple things. If you have for some reason other frogs, you would mill three for each of those individually. We do not have other frogs in this deck. If you mill your library while Grolnok is on the battlefield with a source that is not Grolnok, those cards still get put into exile. So for example, if you have one of our win conditions in this deck, Hermit Druid, you can exile your entire library and all of the permanents in your deck will be exiled with croak counters on them, despite the fact that they're not being milled with Grolnok's initial ability. That's super important for the functionality of this deck. Now the point of this list is to mill our entire library into the graveyard. And there are three main ways we can do that. One, as I mentioned earlier, is Hermit Druid. Now we're not playing any basic lands in this deck. So when you activate Hermit Druid's ability, it will put the entirety of our library into our graveyard. All the permanents will be exiled with croak counters on them and all the instants and sorceries will be thrown into the yard. From that point, we're able to win the game. The other way we mill our entire library is with a combination of Basalt Monolith and Mesmeric Orb. Now Mesmeric Orb says, whenever a permanent becomes untapped, that permanent's controller mills a card. And the cool thing about Basalt Monolith is you can actually infinitely tap and untap Basalt Monolith because it untaps for three generic mana and it generates three generic mana when you tap it. So with the two of these on the battlefield, you tap Assault for three generic mana, then you activate the ability to untap it. Mesmeric Orb recognizes this as a permanent untapping mills over a card. You now have an untapped Assault Monolith that you can continue doing this infinitely. You'll be able to mill your entire library. You won't generate any mana, but you'll be able to mill everything in your deck and they will all get croak counters on them. The last and final way is actually a really cool pile. See, Lightning Greaves is already a piece we kind of want in this deck. One, it gives our Hermit Druid haste, which is huge. A hasty Hermit Druid is very terrifying for our opponents. And since we can win by just activating Hermit Druid, your opponents often don't expect it to just steal the game like that. However, Lightning Greaves also combos with Cephalid Illusionist. See, what Cephalid Illusionist says is that whenever it's targeted by a spell or ability, you mill the top cards of your library, the top three. Now with Grolnok and Cephalid Illusionist out, what you do is you put the Greaves on Cephalid Illusionist, it mills three. You put them back on Grolnok, then you switch them back to the Illusionist, and you repeat this back and forth until your entire library is into your graveyard and you have everything else in exile with Croak Counters on them. Now you might be asking yourself, okay, we have all the Croak Counters, how do we actually win the game? The two ways we win the game are very simple, and for people who've been playing this format a lot, you recognize them. It's Jace Wilder Mysteries, being able to uptick and recognize that you don't have any cards left in your library, you win the game that way, or the Enter the Battlefield ability on Thassa's Oracle. Without a library anymore, you'll be able to play Thassa's Oracle and just win the game. Something very important to note here, there are lines to win with a very protected Thassa's Oracle after you have already milled your entire library. So let's cover it. So you'll be able to play any of these zero mana mana rocks after you mill your library. Lion's Eye Diamond being a very good one because of the fact that we have basically our entire library access, we don't really care about the cards in our hand, so that's just a free three mana. Things like Mach 
Mox Amber, Lotus Petal, always able to be played. Mox Opal, you can usually get it online by the time you're going through these steps. Chrome Mox, you can use the last cards in your hand before you crack your LED to go under Chrome Mox. Stuff like that. So you usually have a decent amount of free mana. To win the game in the most protected way, you need two green and two blue mana. So at the most protected way, I mean, we want to get our Thassa's Oracle and make it uncounterable. So say even if we have played a land this turn, that's why we play Exploration, so that we can play a Cavern of Souls naming Wizard and make our Thassa's Oracle uncounterable. But now the problem becomes, okay, what if they counter our Exploration? We have a solution for that as well. We're playing Allosaurus Shepherd, making our green spells uncounterable, and it itself is uncounterable. So for one green mana, we play the shepherd for a second green mana we play the exploration now we have the ability to play a cavern of souls and we only need one more blue mana to be able to cast our thassa's oracle and have it be uncounterable the entire way through that chain so basically by the point that we are going through these loops by the time you mill your entire library it is nearly impossible for your opponents to disrupt what's happening in this loop you also have other options that we'll talk about when we go through the creatures for things that allow you to disrupt your opponents more aggressively so for example things like spot removal aren't going to affect this loop when you have your entire library milled so that's how we actually win the game one important thing to note is the strength of one card in particular in this deck. And that card is Intuition. Intuition, because of the way it's worded, is insane with Grolnok because it puts the cards from your library either into your hand or into your graveyard. So if you pick three permanent cards with Intuition with Grolnok on the battlefield, you're basically saying three mana, I'm gonna tutor three cards from my library and be able to cast them. That is insanely strong. So a lot of the times with Intuition, what you'll be able to do is assemble the combos that we've mentioned. So so for example, you could get a Hermit Druid and maybe a Lightning Greaves to give it haste and something to protect it like Sylvan Safekeeper or a Malevolent Hermit, something like that. You could get Lightning Greaves and the Cephalid Illusionist, which I think is usually my default pile because it is the cheapest and I think it has the fewest disruption points. Uh, don't, don't hold me to that one. But Or you can also get, once again, we talked about the Basalt Monolith and the Mesmeric Orb. And a lot of the times, and the reason that I play all three of these combos is that with Exiling and removal and stuff like that uh, a bunch of these combos can get disrupted so being able to be able to pivot with your intuition and grab one of the different combos one of my favorite piles to get is if you're not worried about like grabbing spot removal or interaction or something like that you're having lightning greaves hermit druid and cephalid illusionist because if lightning greaves resolves that allows you to have two different ways to win with the lightning greaves on the battlefield so there's a lot of interesting piles that you can grab off of intuition that just straight up win you the game you can even do things like grab a a cephalid illusionist scrub your hermit root and grab something like a brazen bar which although the way the wording is with Grolnok, you think that maybe you would not be able to cast it for its adventure side you actually can because you put permanents into exile with croak counters on them but the casting never asks if it's a permanent Grolnok just says you can play land and cast spells from exile with croak counters on them. So that being said, you can actually use something like a petty theft ability on Brazen Borrower. So for example, you can grab, if there's one permanent stopping you from comboing off, you grab your intuition pile, you can have your cards that will mill your entire library and you can grab spot removal as well. So intuition in this deck is insane, which is why we're playing cards like Merchant Scroll and Solve the Equation, which in a deck full of permanents don't seem traditionally as strong. However, the instants and sorceries we do have access to, they make the cut for a very specific reason. So it's really, really strong in this list. One thing to also note is that we are playing Memory's Journey, which is just very strong when you're doing a lot of self mill stuff entirely. But what that does mean is that there actually are lines for milling your entire library and not having Grolnok on the battlefield. Because what you can do is you can select only a single target with Memory's Journey being something like Thassa's Oracle. You mill your entire library, use your Memory's Journey flashback to put a Thassa's Oracle back in your library, and then draw that as your last card for turn. And there are certain end step loops you can do that don't require you to have Grolnok on the battlefield. Grolnok just makes the process a lot cleaner and a lot faster and a lot more protected, but there are still ways to win the game if you don't have Grolnok on the battlefield. That being said as well, I think a lot of people see this deck and see the focus on the commander, see the focus on the graveyard, casting things out of exile, and they assume it's very weak to Draenith Magistrate, which on paper it is. But because of the way the deck is, we are playing a lot of permanent spells. 
So because we're playing a lot of permanent spells, that means that there's sort of an interesting dynamic that gets created here because permanent spells aren't always the best counter spells, but they're really fantastic removal pieces. So things that you wouldn't always see play, things like Oko, things like Brazen Borrower's Side, uh, things like down here in the enchantment suite, things like Seal of Removal or Kenrith's Transformation or Mystic Subdual mean that you have a lot of spot interaction and a lot of interaction that can be grabbed off of Grolnok's ability. Something like even Spellseeker, which is something you can flip over from Grolnok and it'll grab you the instant sorcery you need. So there's a lot of options that Grolnok provides you. I've played this deck a really good amount and I feel like I've even seen what I would call a disproportionate amount of Dranith Magistrate in those games, like a higher reflection of what I would expect in the meta I have seen against Grolnok in the meta that I've been playing or in the diverse places I tend to play. And even with that being said, I haven't really had a game where I haven't been able to remove the Magistrate. I think within a turn or two of that card coming down, I usually have either an Oko or a Gilded Drake or a Brazen Bar or something that has been able to take out Magistrate. So despite the fact that it is a giant pain for this deck, we're playing a lot more spot removal than I would say the average CEDH list has. And because of that, there's a lot of advantage and ways to be able to circumvent one of this deck's biggest weaknesses. So that's really, really cool. And it's pretty strong. And I really like that about this list. That's one of the things that makes me keep playing it over and over again is that it has inherent weaknesses, but because of the way the deck is slanted and because of the atypicality of the cards that are included in it to work around your commander, it tends to actually play pretty strong against its weaknesses. It's a really cool list in that sense. It really encourages you to play a lot of cards that are not commonly seen in CEDH. And when we go through each category, you'll definitely see that. So something to note is Grolnok is a card advantage engine. 78 of the cards in this list, so minus 14 instants and seven sorceries, leaves us with 78 permanents in this deck. Meaning every time Grolnok attacks, on average, it's flipping over two to three cards that are cards that you have now. So basically every single combat with Grolnok is draw two or draw three. Not to mention there's some stuff you can do with other cards in the deck that will just casually mill you a little bit. Playing Mesmeric Orb specifically, is one of the better combo pieces in the deck because of how much value it provides you. Uh, just just having a Mesmeric Orb without the Basalt Monolith to combo it with usually wins you the game because a lot of the times you have Grown Lock out and you have a Mesmeric Orb and when you untap, you're milling six, seven, eight cards and milling that many cards is just doubling the size of your hand, if not more, and really stops your opponents from doing a lot of things. It's very, very strong in that sense and the fact that all these like casual mill pieces suddenly become really insane card advantage engines with the commander are really cool. I definitely want to take a look at more pieces like this, but Mesmeric Orb is by far the most efficient version of that effect that exists right now, and it's definitely worth exploring other options that exist that may be a little less well known. So I want to go by card type and kind of explore the unique choices for this deck. Uh, Jace, obviously very strong for all the reasons we mentioned. It's one of our win cons. I didn't want to rely on only having Thassa's Oracle that felt pretty flimsy and God forbid our Thassa's Oracle gets removed. We don't want to completely just not have a win condition anymore. I know other versions people were playing were playing things like Kinnon Walking Ballista for Basalt Monolith combos and to me it made way more sense just to include a single card as opposed to going with a completely alternate win condition that folds to more interaction in my opinion. Oko is really strong in this deck. The fact that it is a permanent that is repeated removal. This is the second time I've recorded this video. Unfortunately the first time uh, the audio was not on uh, but as I was saying in that first attempt I have done a lot of exploration with Oko over the years in the fact that Oko is always kind of like the 101st card in the deck. It's always the one that just barely doesn't make it. But there are certain games against certain decks, and especially now in a more stacks heavy meta, where stacks decks tend to rely a lot more on their commanders. Oko being able to just nuke commander after commander and turn them into elks and put your opponents in situations where they get completely shut off their engine and don't really have a chance to remove it unless they take a bunch of extra steps, that ends up being huge. Uh, Oko does a ton of work in any of the slower games in the format. Now again, something like a Turbo Nas deck, it's not nearly gonna be as effective, but in 
a situation where one of those decks is stalled out, where you're turning Krom into an abilityless 3-3, where you're turning Timna into the same thing, when you're turning even more high value commanders, things like a Korvold or an Elsha, or, you know, commanders that the decks rely upon. Oko does a lot of work. And I think it's an underplay card in the format, but it's also a card that is hard to include given just the raw power level of the cards that we play in the format and the fact that it is three mana at sorcery speed as well. Moving on to the creatures, Allosaurus Shepherd, as I mentioned during the combo lines, is super strong. The fact that it makes our commander uncounterable, the fact that it makes Green Sun Zenith something that grabs our Hermitrude uncounterable, our finales and our Neoform, our Eldritch Evolution, the things that often will just grab win conditions right out of the decks. Uh, the, the amount of green cards that not being able to be countered is very, very big. And Allosaurus Shepherd is really awesome include in general and the fact that it also just makes our win conditions uncounterable is really really strong sylvan safekeeper is also just a great include one thing to note with sylvan safekeeper is because the way grolnok works you're flipping over lands a decent amount of time when you attack with grolnok so you're really not often missing your land drops and because of that sylvan safekeeper has a lot of lands to be able to throw away to be able to protect your stuff i noticed that when i have let other people borrow the deck having a grolnok and a sylvan safekeeper out usually means that like that game plan is extremely hard to disrupt in any meaningful way, and I often struggle a lot to be able to get through it. Gilded Drake is awesome in a CEDH list, period. Gilded Drake is awesome in Commander. It's even better in a deck where you can pretty consistently get to it through Neoform, Eldritch Evolution, things like that, or through being able to mill it over with your Commander. Uh, the amount of value it provides in this deck is insane. I get a lot of questions about Malevolent Hermit because of the fact that when you're milling your library with Grohl Knockout, the Disturb cost does not work work the way it would normally work in certain lists because of the fact that it is exiled with Grolnok with a crow counter on it. However, Levelant Hermit is really strong here because one of the things I was kind of struggling with was getting counter spells that I could get with Grolnok's ability. I didn't want my game plan to be completely unprotected, but the way Malevolent Hermit works is it gets exiled as a permanent, meaning you can cast it with Grolnok and you can still hold up that mana leak ability. On top of that, if you want to have your Disturb cost with it, you can do the pattern that I just said, being able to cast it from exile with Grolnok and then the next time it dies, because Grolnok only exiles cards that get milled from your library, if it dies from the battlefield, if you use its sacrifice ability to counter a spell, it then can be disturbed, making all your non-creatures uncounterable. Snapcaster Mage, while being a modern staple, obviously isn't traditionally played in CEDH, but in a deck where your non-permanent cards are thrown into your graveyard and not being able to be accessed when you mill your library, Snapcaster is huge. On top of that, every time you're attacking with Grolnok, you're putting more and more instances sorceries in the graveyard that you can't cast with Grolnok, so having Snapcaster to be able to grab them back and being able to grab your counter spells, being able to grab your tutors, any of those important pieces, Snapcaster is insane in this deck and it puts in a ton of work. As I mentioned earlier, the interaction with Brazen Borrower is really, really strong. It is just very powerful and being able to have a removal spell, a bounce spell at instant speed that you can mill over with your commander is awesome. Endurance is insane in this deck. The ability to kind of create semi loops with your commander, so say for some reason one of your combo pieces gets countered and you need to be able to get all your self mill stuff back in your deck uh the ability for endurance to be able to kind of just reset your whole thing is so huge uh the fact that we play bounce spells that can get recycled with Grolnok also helps a ton so you can do things like grab your seal of removal being able to bounce your endurance back to your hand play the endurance again the seal gets shuffled back in and you can sort of create quasi time twister loops with that. There's some pretty cool stuff. There's a lot of really unique lines with endurance and it basically means that even in tougher situations that the deck wouldn't be able to get out of normally, Endurance kind of opens up and makes them happen. Same thing with Eternal Witness, obviously just a good value card, things like that, but being able to grab it with Grolnok to be able to pick up your instance of sorceries is very, very huge. Bellseeker, fantastic option, can grab you instance of sorceries, can be grabbed off Grolnok. Same as kind of a lot of these options. Tribute Mage specifically is really good because it gets two of our most important pieces. The one that obviously comes to mind after gushing about it for a little bit here is Mesmeric Orb. It turns into a card advantage engine. It is a combo piece. It is really, really easy to grab off of that. The fact that Lightning Greaves is also a combo piece that you can grab means that Tribute Mage is just really good at grabbing the pieces you need at the right time. Nothing too crazy in the sorceries. Just 
tutors that we want to grab creatures at the right time, a lot of important ways to be able to have redundancy to grab intuition or to be able to grab the creatures we need to be able to win the game. Grabbing an early Hermit Druid is obviously super important to the list and being able to grab our combo pieces when we need them is very important. So that's kind of what a lot of these sorceries are here for. As far as the instants go, the only really important ones to know in a Memories Journey, which we said opens up the non Grohl knock win condition lines, Intuition, which is basically a giant build around for this list, and then the rest of them are just tutors and interaction for good combo pieces that we need. As far as the artifacts go, some interesting ones to point out. Mox Amber isn't always played in a lot of these lists that rely on their commander. However, when the commander is one, a central part of the game plan, it really helps. And also it is just another free artifact that can be cast after you mill your entire library with Grolnock on the battlefield. So it's just a card that really helps to clean up what's happening with the game plan. Plus you have enough legendary creatures, your commander included, that its inclusion is often more an online presence than offline. Lightning Greaves is awesome for all the things mentioned beforehand, being able to give your commander haste, allow it to attack without fear of interaction, being able to combo with Cephalid Illusionist, giving your Hermit Druid haste. It's an awesome card here. Earthing Pod's pretty interesting. It doesn't seem like traditionally like it would make a lot of sense, but it's a Neoform effect that can be received off of Grolnok. So you can mill this over and cast it from your crow counters. And a Neoform that you can be able to acquire in such a way is actually really, really strong. Now the enchantments here are probably my favorite part of this deck because there's so many ones that you do not often see. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of permanents that get flipped over our land. So exploration does really, really well in this list on top of the fact that it grabs your Cavern of Souls and makes your win condition uncounterable. Really great here. Seal of Removal is an unsummon on a stick, but it's an unsummon that you can grab off of Rollnock, and as I mentioned, removal in this deck actually becomes pretty important, so that's good. Counterbalance, as I mentioned before, the idea that we want counter spells on a stick, we want counter spells that we can grab off of Rollnock's ability. So, counterbalance being that is a pretty huge player in the deck, and it just kind of makes sense to be in here. It works really well with what we're doing, and the fact that we need permanents that are going to allow us to disrupt our opponents more frequently. Kenris Disruption and Mystic Subduel both do the thing that I was talking about with Oko earlier, where the fact that it makes creatures lose all abilities is really, really strong. So their removal pieces, Kenris Transformation also is a cantrip, which is really nice, but it also is a sorcery speed only, whereas Mystic Subduel, it doesn't change the power and toughness as much. It only gives a creature minus two minus O, but it removes all of their abilities and I have won many a game because I have Mystic Subdueled, either something like a Notion Thief that was about to wheel or a Dranith Magistrate that was about to lock me out of the game or something like that. Mystic Subduel, I think, is a card that is kind of just generally underplayed. Uh, I've played it enough in certain decks that are atypical and have a certain synergy with it, like this deck, that it has made me really value the card high. I think the losing all abilities part of a card is actually really, really strong, and it disrupts certain commander-specific game plans way more than people think. The fact that it also has flash is pretty huge and can be played at instant speed. There's a lot of play to this card, and I'm a big fan. Survival, awesome in any graveyard deck. You're tutoring creatures, creatures are part of your combos, being able to just like instant speed grab a hermit druid next turn give it haste with something uh there's a lot of good stuff you can do here grab yourself a little illusionist grab a creature that will allow you to go two to your win cons there's just so many good things to play around with survival of fittest the only thing really worth mentioning here in the lands there's no basics in here and that's because we're on hermit druid and we cannot play basics so something to note if you're picking up this deck and you're like oh why is gemstone mine in here it's it's because we're a hermit druid mana base and sometimes you gotta you gotta play some unique options to be able to get your game plan going and that's it for the main deck of this list, I feel like the best thing to do now will be to go over some mulligans and then we can go on from there. Okay, this first hand here is, uh, it's not great. We don't have any lands. So we're going to second seven. Okay. So this is a Grolnock focused hand for sure. There's a lot of acceleration though. So we can go without even looking at our draw for turn. We have two land drops technically in the form of Mox Diamond. We can exile the Elish Spirit Guide to play a Birds of Paradise or we can exile the spirit guide and play the mana vaults to be able to get a turn one Grolnok, knock, which is super cool as far as like card advantage is concerned to be able to have a commander out. Or you can take the safer play of uh, playing the birds and playing the mana vault. So either which, depending on the pod, can be really effective. If you know you're in a pod where maybe you want to like grab a opponent's commander with a Gilladrake or grab a Phantasmal image, then maybe you want to prioritize getting the birds down earlier. But if you want to be able to get your grind on earlier, if you want to be able to start slowly going towards a win, turn one Gruel Knock seems really, really strong. So great second seven here. Okay, this is a first seven. It's a little slow. 
I don't love seeing Cavern of Souls in the opening hands. I'm just never a big fan of that happening. Uh, we have Gaia's Cradle in the opening without any creatures. We have Ponder here, which will help us fix our draw a little bit, but for a first seven, it's a little rough. The only time I think I keep this hand as a first seven is if I'm going first, because just turn one Remora into a pod, and to be clear, into a pod that I think will feed the Remora. If it's a pod where I'm like, they, there's a solid chance they're not gonna feed Remora, and they're just gonna play like Dork Pass, Dork Pass, Dork Pass, then you probably don't wanna keep this hand. So uh, there's a lot of places where I wouldn't keep this, which is why I'm gonna mulligan it. The second seven, we have two lands, some counter Magic, Oko, Thoracle, Neoform. There's just not a lot of gas here. Uh, there's not a lot of proactivity. It's a very reactive hand. We have a Fluster Storm, and then we can get like a turn two Talisman down and then an Oko later. It's all pretty medium stuff, so I, I suggest we go down to six. Okay, I'm a simple creature. Sometimes I see that we have a turn one Grolnock. That's really all I care about. As far as what we want to put to the bottom of our library, Grolnock is really, really likely to get us our land drops as soon as we get it down. So I'm inclined to throw one of these lands back, probably the Coliseum at this point, because we're not going to have Threshold for a little bit, even though we're going to have Grolnock early, because the cards don't always, a lot of the cards don't go into the graveyard, they go into exile. So that being said, I think having a turn one Grolnock with Lotus Petal back, actually what we can do is we can go land, Lotus Petal, Talisman into a turn one Grolnock, which is pretty good. And then, so say that was our draw for turn. Next turn, we mill the top three. And this is kind of what I was talking about. Like there's 78 permanents in the deck. So a lot of the time you're flipping over literally just permanents. Um, it's cool having a Cyclonograph in hand. We don't always get exactly what we need. Like, you know, there's situations where we're gonna flip over things like that and, you know, get instant sorceries. But that's, you know, it's part of the deck. So relying on a turn one Grohl knock and getting acceleration out early, a lot of the time you're gonna have dividends paid by going that way. So this hand is super interesting. It's our first seven. I think you like have to keep this, it feels like. Cause the play pattern I'm seeing here is turn two Grohl knock, turn three intuition for the win. So turn one, you just play a land, maybe play it safe. Hopefully maybe you can draw something that'll give you a little more acceleration. Uh, the reason I'm holding the Chromox turn one is because if we draw a green or a blue source that are not these very helpful cards in Pact of Negation or Intuition, you wanna probably exile whatever you draw instead. I don't tend to do the draws when I'm doing these mulligans because I don't think it's very helpful uh, to sort of see what the random top deck might be. I think it's more helpful to work off the knowledge you actually have, which is what's in this opening seven. So the idea is to not play the Chrome Mox, to hopefully draw something better to exile. And then from there, you can turn to have an Ancient Tomb, hopefully something under the Chrome Mox, be able to play Grolnock, turn three, cast the Intuition. If you need to have a Counterspell backup, you can have that. There's a solid chance that the Intuition won't be able to win you the game at Sorcery Speed, but the Intuition sets you up to be able to win the game when it comes back to your turn. Another cool thing you can do with Intuition is say, so say this hand, uh, for some reason you can't go for the Pact on your turn, right? But your opponents are trying to win the game. What you can do is you can cast the Intuition. You can get something like a Counterspell that will stop one of your opponents winning the game. And once again, this tactic only really works when your opponents don't have any other options. You cast that Intuition, grab a Counterspell, and then put your two combo pieces in the graveyard. So for example, Cephalid Illusionist and Lightning Greaves. So you can say like, okay, I'll go grab this Dispel, put the two combo pieces into the Exile with Corrupt Counters on them, and then you can stop your opponent winning and have a combo piece set up for your turn. So intuition, as I mentioned, so good in this deck. <laughs> so yeah, that's why a turn a turn three protection to, for a turn four win seems perfectly fine with me. No lander, get out of here. <sighs> this hand is slow. Holy crud. So you're not doing anything turn one. You're barely doing something turn two, holding up Brazen Borrower and a mental misstep. Then turn three, you get a study. That's that's not CEDH speed. So let's go to six. I definitely keep this hand. Oh, that's a weird hand. <laughs> that is a very strange hand. There's a lot of different ways to play this hand, which is kind of why it's weird. Um, I'm at six, so I'm definitely throwing back the Mox Amber because we don't have any legendaries apart from our commander to turn it on, and it's not gonna be on until our commander comes down. Now, there is an argument for keeping it. You can, on one of your turns, being able to go Grohl Mock and activate using the Mox Amber, activate Hermit Druid specifically, but I think keeping the rest of the hand is fine. Um, you know, if you want to say that like throwing a land back is good, I don't think you throw away the ponder for the force of will reason. Although there's also a chance you use ponder on turn one. So <laughs> if you notice, there's a lot of uh, but 
to this hand, and there's a lot of different ways you can play it. Getting down an early Hermit Druid, being able to activate it on end step using the Memories Journey line like we talked about is a totally valid way to play it. Uh, keeping that Mox Amber, maybe throwing something else back, and playing like turn two Hermit Druid, turn three Grolmnock with activation when the game is a very valid way to play this, but that might involve you having to throw a land back and kind of praying there. So there's a lot of different ways you can play this hand. I think a lot of it depends on their pod composition, where you're seated, who you're playing against, what turn order you're in. So there's many different lines to this hand, definitely a keepable hand, but it's one that requires a lot of nuance and there's a lot of different thoughts depending on what you're playing against. <sighs> turn one removal plus counter spell backup, plus endurance backup, plus noxious revival backup. There's a lot of free stuff you can do with this hand. You have two different removal pieces. You have a force of will, you have an endurance that you can cast for free. Kind of hard pressed not to keep this hand. If you draw a land, you have turn two Grolna. If you don't, you can use Kendra's transformation as a removal spell that also can trips, which can draw you a card for Grolna. There's a lot to this hand. There's a lot of play to it and any hand that gives you this many options, even if you're stuck on mana, I, I think it's really hard to ship something like that back. Now this is an interesting hand. So you can play turn one elf. You could also play turn one exploration, but guys cradle not being able to tap for anything is kind of weird. So turn one elf into turn two cradle. Hopefully you draw a land within the first two land drops so the exploration's online. Um, but being able to play turn two cradle with the ability to like play a Finhorn Elves and then your cradle's tapping for at least two and your command tower is doing stuff. So th there's a lot of stuff you can do with this hand. You have some counter magic backup. Uh, yeah, no, it seems perfectly fine. I think your your draws will inform a lot of what happens here, but you have counter magic. You have the ability to start accelerating your mana very quickly if your draws line up even decently to you. You have solve the equation to be able to grab your intuition, which is obviously, once again, a one card win condition assembler. So yeah, I, I think it's really hard to throw back a hand like this, despite there being a little bit of clunkiness. I think a lot of draws in this scenario make this hand less clunky. So I say go for it. You don't want to make Cavernous Souls name Elf. That's a little awkward. Second seven. <laughs> kind of relying on Ponder here. You have a combo piece without the other half. You have solved the equation to grab your intuition, but you're really relying on Ponder. You don't have any acceleration. Tan's super fine. If you think Gilded Drake is going to make or break a game, then take Gilded Drake and take this hand and be cute and Ponder turn one and do that only but I am inclined to expect a lot more out of my deck. Now there's some cuteness also with the fact that Mox Amber will get turned on if you take someone's commander, but like, I don't know, this isn't a hand I'm excited to keep. So I'm gonna go to six. Six is Brainstorm with the ability to shuffle your library. You have Green Suns on the third turn can grab you a Hermit Druid, but that is not a rate I'm excited about. Uh, you have a lot of stuff that can grab you Intuition. This hand's just so slow. If this was like a four or a five, I might think about keeping this, but I'm gonna go to five here. It's just so slow. Yeah, okay. That's fine. The ability to cast Counterbalance is gonna come later, so I don't want that. Memories Journey, we definitely want back in our library because of the play pattern I'm about to suggest. So turn one, play your Elf. Turn two, get your Hermit Druid out there, and then see if you can go for a cheesy Hermit Druid line. And worst case scenario, if you know it's not gonna work, you can like Merchant Scroll for protection and wait for that to happen or you can hopefully have drawn at least a land in the first three or four turns uh to be able to play your commander so there's a lot of stuff you can do with this hand that's that's for a five that's kind of exactly what we would expect and want uh wasn't a busted five by any means but it was a perfectly fair one let's get let's get like two more keepable hands in here uh this one's garbage super awkward mana base wise yeah no don't need it okay turn one rustic study turn two girl knock protection. I don't think I need to say anymore. This hand's insane. Yeah. Okay. That, I mean, yeah, it's a second seven that has a turn on Rhystic study and turn two commander. And I don't, I don't really think I need to say much more. You don't need my wise insight to see that hand's insane. <laughs> Turn one, Grolnock seems pretty good. As I mentioned, Grolnock allows you to hit your land drops. So unless you're expecting your opponent to really cuck you with a Drandeth Magistrate super early in the game, this hand seems Perfectly fine. The fact that you can get a Rhystic Study down soon. You can have a Green Sun to go grab your Hermit Druid. You have Fimage to kind of do some cute stuff with your commander. Cyclonic Rift is interaction. Misstep is interaction. Yeah, definitely keepable. These hands were both insanely keepable really early. So let's let's get some more difficult ones in here. <laughs> oh man, another one that I'm pretty, pretty feeling good about. So turn one, Ancient Tomb. 
Talisman, hold up interaction, which is great for turn one. Turn two, oh my goodness. Oh, that was actually my draw for turn one, turn two. Uh, oh my goodness, you keep, okay, just drawing, drawing nonsense here, everybody. He just Mesmeric Orb, you can play your commander at the same time. You can you can play Grolnok with protection, just the safe way to go about it. Yeah, there's just so much. Okay, that, that hand's insane. <laughs> All right, deck. <laughs> oh my God, this hand's insane too. Okay, so you turn one, uh, Elf, Mana Crypt, Mox Amber. Next turn, you play your commander. You have free counter magic. You have more mana up of Mox Amber. This is before any of our draws for the turn, so you can play Elves and... Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know why we're getting all these nuts hands right here at the end. <laughs> An another snap keep for me, uh, turn one Sylvan Library, turn two Commander or Oko uh, or Counterbalance if you need to play it safe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, turn one Sylvan Library, another snap keep I, with lands. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know why the deck's doing this now. All right. Okay, this is this is a little more difficult. I mean, it's still a snap keep for sure. This is either a turn one counterbalance or a turn one grim monolith. Uh, I'm inclined to exile Jace here. I know it's our backup win con, but scenarios like this are why we play Jace and Thassa's Oracle so that we're not like, oh my God, if I lose one, the game's over. So I don't mind a turn one counterbalance by any means. Uh, keeping a fetch land's pretty cool. We have counterbalance on the battlefield. We can play Grolnok. We can't play Grolnok turn two if we go for the counterbalance line, but we can play it turn two if we go for the grim monolith line. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff we can do here. There's actually, if you go grim monolith, turn one, then I'm pretty sure turn two, even with the cards in hand, ignoring any draws you may or may not have, you can go one, two, three. So colorless floating play, Grolnok knock, play counterbalance. Yeah, so I think you definitely go for the Grim Monolith line because the turn one, <laughs> turn one Grim Monolith into turn two Grolnok knock counterbalance seems pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah, that's insane. Okay, okay. How about you, Hand? Are you going to be more reasonable? No, it's actually also pretty good. So land, exploration, land, mana dork, lotus petal, turn to girl knock. I, I'm trying to show you guys some medium hands, but these have all been gas. Uh, if, also, some of the reasons I really like this deck, a lot of the hands have a lot of play to it. Getting girl knock out. It's one of those things when you have a card advantage commander, a turn two, turn one commander that does a good amount of stuff that has a lot of play to it. As I mentioned, 78 hits in the deck and you're milling three cards at a time. So there's a lot of times that girl knock attacking is an ancestral recall. That's crazy. This deck's pretty good at getting hands that are keepable. All right, here we go. This hand's not Great, but you don't really want to rely on having one land, one dork. No way to get acceleration out early particularly well. Turn three, Grolnok knock is kind of slow. If you go like land, dork, don't draw any lands, you play Grim Monolith, then turn three, Grolnok, knock, and that's, you're not really doing a lot with that hand. So second seven. This is a <laughs> turn two, Grolnok. knock. <laughs> <laughs> we have to solve the equation to grab your one card win condition. I don't know. Maybe the deck's busted. No, this just it's it's all really consistent. So if you're if you're a big fan of these like green blue consistency piles, this is the deck for that. Now if you notice that not all these hands have protection in them, that's definitely something to worry about. Hand obviously you can pivot to using solve the equation to grab protection if your opponents are like really about to pop off or something. Uh, but the deck's really solid. It is just really solid at getting these grindy hands. It's really solid at like being able to use Grolnok as this like consistent card advantage engine to be able to slowly try and win over and over again. I think that's one of the deck's biggest advantages is that with things like Snapcaster and Endurance and cards like Memory's Journey to shuffle things back in and the fact that there's so much recursion and ability to like go for a win attempt. Okay, that didn't work. I'm going to reshuffle my library back in and go for it again. Or, you know, I'm going to go try and play one of my combo pieces. One of those combo pieces got countered. I'm going to Eternal Witness it back. I'm going to Noxious Revival it back. I'm going to use my snapcaster to get back a win condition i'm gonna snapcaster back my intuition to grab the second combo pile there's a lot of stickiness and a lot of play to this deck that has been just so much fun to play <laughs> it's one of those things like when you play thrasios and seaborn muse and like the grind engines are like going up against each other and it's like it's some of my favorite magic the the really my mana engine my card advantage engine is going to phase against your card advantage engine and every every turn this person's trying to win then this person's trying to win then this person's trying to win it's so much fun. I have absolutely adored playing this list. I got a lot of comments asking to do a deck tech on this video, and I'm glad we did because it's been so much fun talking about it. It's a super fun deck. I'm super excited for people to be able to get to play it. Obviously, the deck list will be down in the description below. If you guys enjoyed this, 
please remember to hit like and subscribe. I would love to hear in the comments which frog is your favorite. If you're a Grolnok stan like myself, or if you are someone who thinks the Gitrog monster is the untouchable frog of the CEDH format, I'd love to hear your comments down below. Any deck that gets to play like busted hermit druid stuff, I'm I'm gonna love. And this has been so much fun to brew with. If you are a Grolnok player and you know any wacky permanents that you think are really important in the deck, love to hear about those. Or if you know any of those self mill things like we were talking about early in the video that are worth exploring that we haven't really gotten to or that aren't featured in the deck so far, love to hear those as well. Thank you so much everybody for watching. Remember to hit like and subscribe. Go over to that Patreon if you feel like helping out the channel and any support helps a ton. I really appreciate this entire community. Rollnock was brewed a ton in the Comedian MTG server when Crimson Vow first came out. So if you want to be part of the brewing process, it is free to enter the server. There are patron channels, but the places in which all these awesome decks are brewed, a lot of the decks featured on the channel. It is in the Comedian MTG server, so the link down below allows you to come jump on in and it's an awesome place. Love having new people there. Love having people to brew. It's a great time. All right, buddy. I hope you enjoy this episode and I'll catch you next time. Peace.